Hey, our founder, Harry Barth, at the asset protection firm, Barth Calderon, just delivered an incredible talk on what's going on in the asset protection world to a group of dynamic business owners and CEOs. And the host of this episode is Marla Noel, who's an incredible consultant and coach, advisor to CEOs. And as you can see there on my laptop, we are editing up this uh, this live presentation right now. We're going to stream it. Wanted you to have a copy of it and to jump in and check it out. It's brand new, hot off the presses. And so this is our latest episode of Wealth Protector TV from our founder, Harry Barth. Don't miss it. Let's go check it out. I want to say thank you, Marla, for having us, and thank you, everybody, for being here. We, we always know how busy everybody is. I'm Paul Hitchcock. I work with Harry Barth, and Harry is the founder and senior managing partner of a law firm by the name of Barth Calderon. We're an asset protection estate planning business planning firm located in Orange County, California. So we're in the city tower building there next to the block. I'm sure everybody knows where that is. Been there for many years. We've been around for 35 plus years. And we have about 50 people uh, as part of our firm. So we're pretty big uh, with about 5,000 clients across the country. Do a lot of workshops, about 40 a year. And Harry is our top speaker and very well qualified to give this compelling talk on asset protection. Harry's got a doctorate, two master's degrees and about 12 other advanced planning degrees. So he's in very high demand for these talks. We're giving them all across the country. And uh, I want to mention here that, um, you know, there's a lot of questions that come up when we give this talk. And typically, this is a three-hour talk that Harry gives, so it's condensed and it's going to be packed. Uh, but if you want to get one-on-one -on -one with Harry and the team as a follow-up, I'll put in chat uh, a way to do that, my email and uh, a link you can get on the calendar to answer any questions you have as a follow-up to this. And so um, with that, Harry, it's all you. Great. Good morning, everybody. It's 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 great to be here in our in our virtual world, and um, you know it's it's just been you know the last couple of years I've been doing this all all on Zoom uh, rather than flying around the country and in person. There's both benefits and not. So today we're going to talk a little bit about asset protection. The first thing I want to do is kind of uh, define asset protection for everybody. And now, as Paul said, this is typically three hours, two and a half to three hours long. We're going to do it in an hour. And so we're going to lay the foundation, and then we're going to talk about specifics of California law that impact each and every one of us and some changes that have occurred over the last year or so. So what is asset protection anyway? I mean, people have all these various different definitions. It's basically for all of us organizing our assets in such a way as it makes it less likely that we'll be engaged in a protracted litigation and less like and more likely that we'll be out of it relatively quickly. It's not hiding assets, it's not evading assets, it's not secreting assets on an island somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. It's really good logical structuring that's really, really, really important. And you know, in you know, maybe I'm a little jaded. I've been doing this for close to 50 years. I think that any of us that have any assets, even a home you know, should make sure that we're holding them in such a way that they're protected from the uh, claims of third-party creditors as best as we possibly can. I think it's, it's foolish um, if we don't. So something else that's kind of in the last couple of years that have become interesting is in addition to all the traditional, when I say traditional, car crashes, you know, fiduciary responsibilities, problems that come as a result of owning real estate, problems that are coming as a result of owning a business. We have COVID and COVID has added a new level of litigation. And I wanna just talk about that for a second. You know, and I don't believe we have yet seen the beginning of the COVID type litigation. The other day I was, uh, I was watching TV, which I, don't, I do very rarely, and all of a sudden I saw these personal injury lawyer type people advertising as to whether or not our workplace was a safe workplace 
as far as the COVID uh, pandemic was concerned. And here's an example. This, this may sound a little weird to you, but we're already seeing this happen. I just want to throw it out there because, you know, every, every era that I've worked over the last five decades has its new kind of, this is the most ridiculous, but here we go again. So here's what happened. So we have a workplace. You know, we've had, you know, vaccinated, non-vaccinated, anti-vaxxers, whatever may be, appropriate spacing in the workplace. Um, some people who work remote, some people who've not worked remote. And now what happens is a person, an employee in your workplace gets COVID. Young person gets COVID. California has decided in its wisdom that, and I say that facetiously, that um, if one gets COVID, the presumption is, is they got COVID in the workplace. Now, they did this in order to shove COVID cases under the workman's compensation system. So now what happens is, is, you know, little Sally gets COVID. The presumption is they got it in the workplace. And little Sally goes home and little Sally uh, spreads the COVID infection to grandma because she lives with grandma in the house. Grandma gets a highly complicated case of COVID and grandma dies. And the next thing you know, and this is already happening, is we are sued for the wrongful death of grandma because we did not have allegedly a safe workplace for little Sally. I mean, think about that. And this is probably just beginning. And so we have that. Oh, we have the pricing issues. We have the PPP issues. We have the EIDL issues. We have refunding issues. The inability to perform because of COVID. We talk about force majeure, which is an act, is COVID an act of nature? Is it not? All of these areas have yet to be fully and properly litigated. So I'm anticipating that we're going to see a bucket full of COVID-related um, litigation as if we didn't have enough already. Now, there are, there are axioms of asset protection that are very important for me to share with all of you uh, this morning. And there are three of them. And so let's take them one by one. And we'll, we're gonna do this as all the foundational stuff and then we'll get to specifics. But the first foundation or the most important one, one engages in proper and professional asset protection you don't do it after the fact. Uh, that may sound obvious, but we receive, I would say at least three to four uh, contacts per week from people who have have issues. They know that we are uh, the quote unquote asset protection attorneys. And they're saying this happened, that happened. You know, someone fell off the banister at my rental property and they were severely injured. What can I do to protect my assets? My spouse had a bad wreck on a freeway. Uh, several people were severely injured. You know, what can we do to protect our assets? So I think it's really important to understand that it, for, for asset protection to be effective and properly done, it needs to be in place before an event occurs. I want that to be that critical, that seminal. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can't help afterwards, but the help afterwards is, is, is mediocre as compared to proper and proper proper preventative planning. It's like trying to buy fire insurance when the house is on fire. It, it, just, it just doesn't happen. So that's a very important component. Next component of asset protection that I'd like to share with all of you is a, uh, it's an urban myth. I don't know where it comes from, but that's out there. And that is the living revocable trust. You know, the trust that we put together guys and girls for estate planning to provide very important documents to provide probate avoidance, to provide a game plan for the family as we move from one generation to the next. Living revocable trusts provide zero asset protection. I will hear, oh, my bank accounts are in my trust, my house is in my trust, therefore it's protected, correct? Trusts are very interesting things. There are trusts that are protective and trusts that are not protective at all. 
the tr a living revocable trust, the, the family trust that we all have is not protective at all. It is there for estate planning purposes, not for asset protection purposes. So I think that's very important to understand. You know, when we use the word a trust, a trust is like using the word an automobile. There are hundreds and hundreds of types of automobiles. There are hundreds and hundreds of types of trusts. And we kind of say, I have a trust, but that just means I have a contract, which is a trust. Now, what its nature, what it can do, what it can't do, how protective it can be or not be has yet to be determined. The third axiom that's very important for us to understand in the world of asset protection is the over-reliance on insurance. Insurance is a very important component. And when we sit with a client, one of the first things we review is all the insurances that we have. We have liability insurance on top of liability insurance and umbrella insurance on top of umbrella insurance. And so we, we need to understand that insurance is a very important part of asset protection, but insurance is not the know all end all. So if Bill, you have a, you know, a $5 million umbrella policy, that's great. So we think it's great, not overly expensive. Question is, what if there's a judgment of seven and a half million? You know, where does the other two and a half million dollars come from? We seem to think we have this attitude that the amount of umbrella insurance that you buy, should you buy it at all, will be the maximum amount that the attorney that's prosecuting or the plaintiff that's prosecuting a case against you is going to go for. There's no relationship between them. In other words, if it's a $10 million judgment and we have $4 million of insurance, assuming it's even insured at all, we still have a $6 million problem. So we have, we have that issue. The other issue that, that we find is, I think, a little bit of a misrepresentation from the insurance industry. So when we talk about umbrella coverages, for, for those people that, you know, lay people, they're not insurance agents. You know, when's the last time you actually sat down and read that contract? Um, there are many, as many holes in there as this in Swiss cheese. There are 65 pages of covenants, conditions, and exclusions. And I have an attorney that does nothing more, one of my 30 attorneys, that goes after insurance companies all the time on bad faith claims because they're not paying. They're quick to take your premium, but they're, they, you know, all of a sudden, they have all these conditions to pay a claim. And so if we have something that's punitive damage, special damage, exemplary damage, or not within the four corners of, uh, of the policy, we may not have any coverage at all. We may get something which is called well, a, a reservation of rights letter. It says, hey, well, we have the claim, thank you. We will defend you on the claim. But if the claim turns out to be valid under section 2.5.2 subparagraph one, it is not covered. So, ugh, we have, we have those issues. And the other thing too to remember is that insurance companies, they're paying for lawyers and they're paying for litigation. Litigation is interesting. Um, first of all, I have a theory. And it's a theory I've had for a long time that Marla, all your people, all us business people, none of us belong in a courtroom. It's not a good place for us. The judges and the juries, they're not super friendly to those of us that are in business. Better that we mediate a settlement, better that we're dealing in private arbitration, you know, where we can kind of control, you know, get out in the public environment uh, and get away from juries as best as we possibly can. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think that we recognize that with insurance, we are basically just finding a way to fund the litigation for the lawyers. So insurance is important, don't get me wrong, but it's not the know-all, end-all, as we'll learn today. I think it's the interrelationship of the appropriate structuring combined with um, with with insurance that gives us the uh, protection uh, that we need. And it's also a, an attitudinal problem. And I think this is very important for our talk today and, and it needs to be said. And when, whenever I speak about attitudinal problems or I venture into what you would consider to be a political statement, it's not a political statement. It's just how we fare should we have a liability that falls under the, the, the concepts of, uh, of asset protection. And we've all heard politically uh, up through uh, the Obama administration, uh, a breath, uh, a take back during 
during the Trump administration and now again during the Biden administration, income inequality, wealth concentrating in the hands of the smaller number of families, and they think that this is particularly wrong. So instead of rewarding capitalism, in many ways, they are vilifying capitalism. And the more wealth you have, the greater the target on your back and the greater inequality that we have in the judicial system. Instead of social justice, we're getting, in many respects, social injustice. So that leads us to the self-help remedies of making sure that we protect ourselves properly. And so I'm going to give you a tour of that today. But some interesting statistics. Um, I'm not going to take you through jury bias and all the other things. I'm in the courtroom all the time. But if we could take a guess, so uh, we'll pick on someone. Hey, Pete, you're there with the guitars in the background. I got a question for you. How many lawsuits do you think were filed in America? Let's go to 2019 before the pandemic, because the pandemic kind of changed things around a little bit. How many lawsuits do you think were filed in America? Take a guess. 10 million. 10 million. Close, but no cigar. So. Believe it or not, in 2019, 50 million lawsuits were filed in the United States. 50 million. Now, remember, every crime lawsuit, every divorce lawsuit, every tax action lawsuit, every immigration, every, every, every constitutional action, tort, contract, every time we interact with the judicial system, it begins with a complaint. It's a lawsuit. 50 million. We, and this is another statistic that's really interesting as we move forward this morning. 95% of all litigation in the world occurs in the United States of America. Only 5% occurs outside the United States of America. Whoa, ho, let's take a second think about that. Why do you think that is? So, because I don't have the time to, for us to play around back and forth, I'll tell you why it is. So we have some things about, one, just that we are, we are, probably still are, the largest economic engine in the world. Uh, we have more corporations, more businesses, more transactions. We are a nation under law. It's, we, we follow uh, a legal system. It's more likely than not, as compared to any other nation, we would have the most interaction uh, with contract and, and businesses and lawsuits. That's true. The other thing is that we have a couple of things that are different than the rest of the world. So one of them is we don't have... Uh, the, the basic concept, other than by a contract change, of loser pays. Pays for your lawyer. So, so I bring a crappy lawsuit against you, you know, Roberto. I bring crappiest lawsuit on, on hell. It's already going to cost you money. See, there's no contingency fee um, uh, defense attorneys. You've got to pay. And so you'll turn around at the end of the day, most of the time, you'll wind up paying me the cost of defense and maybe some more money. This is crazy, but it's true. And we never got to the merits of the case. We just paid off because, hey, it was cheaper to pay off $150,000, $200,000 than it was to litigate that case to determine who was right or wrong. A business decision gets made. In other countries, in most other countries, and I've practiced in a couple of others, it doesn't work that way. If I bring a crap lawsuit, I lose. I'm paying your legal fees. Now, we can adjust that, ladies and gentlemen, by contracts. When we look at a contract, when we sign a business contract, when we sign other types of contracts, we, which you don't look at, we can pick the fact that we don't want a court, we want private dispute resolution. We can put down that we want prevailing party to pay, you know, uh, the, the, the losing party to pay attorney's fees. We can do that if we take the time in advance before we enter a deal to establish the contractual relationships properly. The next thing we have, so we don't, we don't, we have, we all, the other thing we have started as a great idea. The great idea was contingency fee lawyers. All right. We all see them, right? They're on the freeway, on the billboards, everywhere we look, you know, sweet James, this guy, you know, Jacoby and Myers, the guy that chases the motorcycle people, the bad drug people. My God, they're all over the place. You pay nothing, you know, unless we recover uh, for you. So what started out as a great concept, the judicial system is expensive. Lawyers are expensive just by their very nature. So in America, we felt that the, those people that were less fortunate than ourselves did not have equal access 
to the legal system. So we allowed, as, 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 as a part of a concept, we allowed lawyers to partner with victims or plaintiffs as a partnership at 60-40, 70-30, 65-35 to bring a case so the case is financed by the lawyer against you. In most countries in the world, that is completely illegal. That encourages a tremendous amount of litigation, which started as a noble idea, turned into mass torts, mass class actions, private attorney, PAGA lawsuits in California, private attorney general, you know, where every person, every employee that you have as their own private attorney general against you, wage and hour issues just goes on and on and on. It is a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And so America has a lot of that, especially those of us in California have experienced all kinds of, this. We, sometimes we work in fear in California uh, as a result of some of these uh, these rules that we have. So we have contingency fee lawyers that are partnering with, uh, you know, when someone you someone works for you, you know, Pete, and they, they feel that they're aggrieved, they'll find somebody, they don't have to pay a lawyer a dime, they'll pick up the case for 30%, and there we go. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, so that contributes to that. And the other thing that we have that contributes to this is that in most countries in the world and most around the world, there's no such thing as, punitive damages. There's just no such thing. In other words, if you do something intentionally, you're going to pay fines, you're going to go to jail, do whatever you got to do. If you do something negligently, then you got to pay to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. That, that all makes sense. We understand that. If I cause injury as a result of my negligence, I should pay. I understand that. But if a jury determines that I was grossly negligent, or perhaps in the contract, they're, they're screaming that it was an intentional misrepresentation, and it falls under what they call wanton, willful, and reckless conduct, which is a concept that's been expanding over the years. Then they add another thing. So if you ever seen a complaint, I'm sure some of you have, hey, well, not only do we want compensatory damages, we also want punitive damages in whatever the you know, the jury and the, and the court determines. So it could be $100,000 of compensatory damages and a million dollars of punitive damages that keeps you in the case. And something is very important to understand, not a single insurance policy will pay for that. It's 100% you. So that, that, that just makes the pot of gold bigger. So we got a big pot of gold, we have contingency fee lawyers, and we have loser doesn't pay. So we set the stage for that 50 million lawsuits and a societal norm uh, that's very, very important. And the societal norm inherently is nobody wants to take responsibility for what they've done in America. So it's always pointing the blame someplace else. You know, you look at a lawsuit, you know, where, where there's a, a problem on the corner, you sue the city, you sue the manufacturers of the sign, you sue the driver, you sue the people who put the stripes on the. I mean, it goes on and on and on as to all of the potential defendants that happen from any particular lawsuit. So we have an explosion, and I think that explosion is going to get worse. We had a little bit of a respite uh, during the lockdown and the pandemic. People couldn't get into court. The courts were closed, but that's all going to, to change. Before I get to specifics, and specifics are very important for us this morning, I'll, I'll use the back end of the last half hour as the specifics. I want you to understand something that asset protection is not new. Let's use an analogy together. And let's say we're back in the Middle Ages, and Marla, you and your group have been a marauding army. And over the years, We've prosecuted a war. We worked very, very hard. We invested money. We turned around. We lost lives. We lost limbs. We won. We won the war. So in all probability, we're entitled to receive the spoils of war, the treasure that comes after all of our hard work. How did you and know it, I had a mom? I just knew. I could tell. And then, and then what happens is if we would, even back then, take in the spoils of war and brought them back to our little idyllic village, you know, like you see in Lord of the Rings, the, the, the idyllic village, you know, a little, you know, the house with the thatch cottage and the round doors and everything. For us this morning, we'll call it, you know, naive land. And we just placed everything we've worked so hard for in the center of the plaza. And what happens is the barbarians and the robbers come out of the woods, out of the forest and steal all our crap that we worked all so hard for. 
believe me, the analogy is the same today. If we're not protecting our assets, the barbarians and the robbers will come in and take our stuff. So even back in the Middle Ages, they did it. They were go, go, go to England, go someplace. They built a castle with thick walls, and they put their things that were important to them behind the walls of the castle. But the walls weren't enough. The thick walls, they dig a moat, and they filled the moat with water and allegedly with crocodiles and alligators and all kinds of bad things that so you shouldn't go in the water. And then they had turrets with archers. You know, they had all of these layers of protection. So the hope was when the robber barons came, they would look at the fortifications and guess what? If the fortifications were too strong, they would attack where the fortifications were not as strong. Now, you may not like this and it may seem distasteful, but in today's legal world, it's exactly the same. So these contingency fee lawyers and other law firms, we don't have un endless resources. We don't. We have to pick and choose carefully. If both Bill and say Dwight are both involved equally in a similar contractual or tortious liability, we will do some homework. We will hire a private investigator. And if Bill's assets are well behind the walls and Dwight's assets are not, here's what's going to happen. This sounds awful, but what's going to happen? Bill, will settle with you. We'll take your insurance. You give me 10 cents on a dollar, I'll drop you from the lawsuit. You're gone. Now I have funded. And now I'm going to bring all my lawyers against Dwight because we can recover the most from him, his walls are not there. We have millions of dollars in the bank. We discovered all of that. Here we go. We bring all the guns against Dwight and Dwight is hammered as a result of it. This is the what asset protection is all about. It's building walls. We can have no walls around the things that you've built, you know, that you've put together. We can have low walls. We can have high walls. And the higher the wall, just affect, just, just trust me on this, the more likely than not we will settle a case at a lower denomination than we would if we didn't have walls. It's just a fact of life. There are rare cases that are they're slightly different than that, but that's how it works. So what I'm going to do um, now is I'm going to walk you around in California law and tell you about some new laws that are coming to effect and some things that I think could be helpful for each and every one of us Again, this is the abbreviated version, so let's get into some specifics. I think we've laid enough foundation. So at the heart of everything, uh, let's turn around and talk a little bit about our homes. All right, so we have houses. You know, some of the most valuable assets that people have in California are their homes. And so people, I will literally, in Vistage groups, even in California and other groups I talk to, I will ask them, they said, well, hey, if you have a liability, a significant liability, car crash, this, better, whatever it may be, uh, do you think that your home is safe from the claims of creditors? And believe it or not, CEOs will turn around, raise their hands, and 50% of them say, oh, yeah, we have a homestead exemption in California. It is safe from the claims of creditors. Well, that may be true in, universally in Texas, maybe true universally in Florida, Kansas, if you ever want to live in those places. But here are the rules in California, and they changed in 2021. So it's very important to understand what the rules are on your house. So let's understand that. So before 2021, here was the deal. If you were a single person, you owned a house, and you had 70, up, if you could have up to $75,000 of equity in your home, and then guess what? If you, they, you, give, you, get, you keep the 75,000, if you have more than 75,000 equity, we're gonna sell your house to pay the claim and give you a check for 75 grand. That's what it was. Then if you were married, and it went by married, um, um, they would give you $100,000 of equity that was exempt from the claims of creditors. And if we were over age 65 or a disabled person living in the home, it was $175,000 of equity was exempt from the claims of creditors. Got it. And not very much considering the property values in, in California, and a lot of homes uh, would be lost. Now, Last November, literally a year ago, almost to the day, in the quiet uh, time before Thanksgiving, Newsom signed a new homestead bill. And it wasn't out of the good graces to protect us in California. It was a concern that as a result of the pandemic, so many people would lose their homes and wind up on the state 
payroll that they increased the exemptions for all of us on our homes. So let me give you the new exemptions that went into effect on January 1st, 2021. So first of all, now it, this whole status, marriage, single, well, the age gone, uh, absolutely gone. And so now that the minimum California homestead exemption is $300,000 and the maximum California homestead exemption is $600,000. And by law, it must be adjusted for inflation every year. So what was the difference between the 300 and the 600,000? It was based upon the median selling price of a home in the county where you live. So in Orange County, it was over 600,000. So in the Orange County homestead exemption, $600,000. LA County, 600,000. San Diego County, 600,000. Riverside County, like 480,000. San Bernardino, also about 480,000. Contra Costa, 600,000. San Francisco, 600,000. You can kind of figure it out from there. So we now have uh, a six, basically a $600,000 homestead exemption in Orange County. That, that's a significant increase. And so, so there, if you take the mortgage that we have on the, on the, on the property, so you have a mortgage, add 600,000 to it, subtract the amount that would the cost to sell a property. If we have, if we're less equity than though that combination of three things, then your home is considered to be an exempt asset from the claims of creditors. So it doesn't matter, all right? You're not gonna lose your house. If you have more than $600,000 of equity in your house, your house will still be sold. You get a check for $600,000 and call it a day. And it does happen every single day of the week. So when we talk about that, so one of the things from an asset protection perspective is the determination of the amount of equity in a home, and then the various different tools that we have to protect the home. Of course, one of the tools is to decrease the amount of equity in the home to below 600,000, it's exempt. Another thing we do is, uh, which I don't have time to explain in depth, is to use a land trust and assigning beneficial interest using qualified personal residence trust, uh, sales to intentionally defective grant purchase. There are tools that we have that we can fashion around the home. But one of the interesting ones that's uh, not as obvious to everybody for people that are married in California is that the, the home in many cases is a community property asset. And so what we have is a community property liability. So if, uh, if Harry crashes his car, uh, even though my wife has nothing to do with it, she's doing something else, it becomes a liability community. We all know community property and a lot of people think it's 50-50. It's really not. It's 100% of the community while, we are, while we're married and it's divided 50-50 in the event of a dissolution marriage. So what happens is we have the home, it's a community home. Even if it was a community property home, you put it in a trust, still a community property home, it's community property. And now a liability to me, liability to my spouse becomes a liability to both of us. We look down at our house, it is greater than $600,000 of equity. We have both, the community is the owner, the community is the liability, we lose our home. And it's probably one of the first places that a plaintiff's attorney will pick on us because it will make us the most uncomfortable. What could we have done about that? Um, you know, think about this. In all, the, all of the states, guys and girls, that are not community property states, which is 39 of the other ones, the rules are different. The rules say that one spouse's liability is not the liability of the other spouse absent that spouse's consent. So if I crash the car and God forbid injure some people, it's Harry's liability. It's not Tessa's liability as a result. And we just look to Harry's assets to satisfy that claim and not Tessa's assets to satisfy that claim. Me to tell me that half my assets could be protected because they're from one person, the answer is yes. That's the way it would be in New York, Massachusetts, Florida, Illinois, most of the country, but not here in California. But we can not after the fact, but beforehand, enter into agreement between my wife and myself, which we have, that says, hey, look, half the assets are mine, half the assets are yours, my liabilities are my liabilities, your liabilities are your liabilities, and now our home is owned 50-50, 50% by Harry, 50% by Tess. And Harry's not responsible for Tess's liabilities, and it's not responsible for mine. Whoa, first I just put half the assets off the table 
for a liability that is just mine. And I could do this. The default is community property, but we don't have to live by it. We can change it with an appropriate post-marital agreement. And now, what am I going to do? The liability comes to me. I own half a house. But they can't throw my wife out of the house in order to satisfy the claim so they could place a lien over my 50% and we could begin to negotiate a settlement to our, our deal, uh, our liability, uh, without, without um, losing the house. So I, I think that's a really big thing that people need to, to understand. So we'll leave the house here. There's a lot, of, a lot of ramifications about everything I'm talking about is an hour unto itself, but just put that on the side. Let's talk about some other things that I see along the way. Um, so one of the other, so we have money, you know, money in the bank, stocks, bonds, cash, all of those kinds of things. Well, that's just low hanging fruit. That's gone. They're just, they're just gone. There's a goner assets. Um, unless we take steps to protect those, I'll come back and talk about that for a moment. But let's talk a little bit about uh, another area that I see that people do not recognize properly in California, and that's dealing with retirement plans. A lot of people have a lot of money, 401k, defined benefit plans, profit sharing plans, SEP plans, IRAs, SEP IRAs, Roth IRAs, this qualified retirement plans. And the concept is, is that what happens in California to those assets if a liability comes to myself or my spouse? All right, so let's talk about it a little bit because it's not as straightforward as we might think. So, so assets or, or retirement plans, qualified retirement plans that are ERISA qualified retirement plans, meaning that it, to make it easy for everybody, at least we have one employee other than your spouse participating in the plan with you. Those assets by federal law and followed by California are 100% exempt from the claims of creditors. You have a million dollars in your 401k plan, two and a half million dollars in your defined benefit plan, a $12 million judgment coming against your bill. Those assets are safe from the claims of creditors. All right, profit sharing plans, 401k plans, defined benefit plans, money purchase plans, cash balance plans, all those safe, 100% safe. But now we have qualified plans in California that are not ERISA qualified plans. And what would those be? We'll make the simple analogy, an IRA, an IRA now. So when I look at people's financial statements and I see that they have a large IRA, my first question is, is that what are the rules with regarding um, IRAs? Um, so, um, uh, IRAs in California, and this is state by state, most states, about 40 states say that the money that you have in your qualified plan, which include an IRA is exempt from the claims of creditors. Just makes sense in, in their state's mind. California says, no, California says the amount in a qualified, but non ERISA plan is exempt to the extent that it's reasonable and necessary for the support of a debtor in a judicial determination. Ugh. So that 400,000 or 500,000 that's in an IRA could, when it's got, it gets into court, be authorized to be given to a creditor. Now think about that, Bill. <laughs> the 500,000 bucks goes to the creditor and guess who gets the tax bill and the penalty if you're under 59 and a half. You do. Wow. That is a horrible scenario. It's really a bad, a bad case. Now, up until about 10, 12 years ago, when you took money out of a 401k or you changed employment and you rolled into a rollover IRA, you left a protected environment under California law and went to a non-protected environment in the, in the retirement plan. And there was a case, uh, I think it was R.A. Michaels, that basically said that if we can trace that this, the, the source of the money in the IRA came from an ERISA qualified plan, it keeps its ERISA protection and will be exempt from the claims of creditors. So that, that was a really good, but without a limitation. So, so sometimes you look and you see people have a large amount of money sitting in their IRAs and that money... Uh, came from, you know, when they worked, you know, at the Joe Blow Inc. 
and now they turn around and they rolled it into their IRA, it'll continue to be an exempt asset. And Barry, so, is, an, is an individual 401k plan an ERISA qualified plan? No, it's not. If, there, if there's no employees participating in the plan, if it's just a husband and wife or just a solo 401k, it's a qualified plan, but not an ERISA qualified plan. Okay. So, so, so we have to deal with that. So we have to take a look at that. First of all, it's not a blanket. Yeah. They're exempt from the claims of creditors. There is, there is some, there's some differences in a federal bankruptcy than there is under California law, but we're not going to cover federal bankruptcy uh, today. We're just going to cover California law. So, so we take a look and see where it comes from and see whether it's exempt or not exempt. And if we have a large IRA that's not exempt, you know, or we think would not be exempt, there are tools that we can use to protect that IRA. Uh, you know, we'll just we'll make it simple, just throw it out. We can use a self-directed IRA with a checkbook LLC and pick up the LLC protection inside the IRA to make ourselves a little bit better off. But there's another important component that you all need to understand. And that is what happens to the money or the assets, if we take it out of the IRA, take it out, you know? So uh, we wanna take money out of the IRA and you know, do something with it, and there's a liability against us, what happens there? Well, states have three different patterns on that. One pattern is, is that if you take it out of the protected uh, account and it lands in your name, Bill, well, I got a judgment against you, goodbye. Another one says, another state says, or must, many states say, you know what it really is? It's deferred compensation, it's deferred wages. So we're going to apply the wage garnishment rules to that. And so 25% of the money that you took out, Bill, goes to the creditor, 75% of it you can keep. Better, better, better. California is very, very liberal here, uh, which is just typical California in this respect. And one, if, if the, in California, if the tree is an exempt asset, the fruit of the tree keeps its exemption. So if you took $300,000 bill out of your exempt um, qualified plan and bought a boat with it called the HMS exemption, that boat keeps the exemption as well. As long as we could trace it back to the tree. California, very, very liberal. So when we're looking at retirement plans, we need to make sure that we um, understand the vulnerabilities that they have because the ramifications of a retirement plan being taken by a creditor is not just the money's loss, but the tax liability and the potential penalty that goes along with it. All right, let me continue on a little bit. So um, very important uh, when we talk about, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what I, uh, other things that I see in, 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 in the little bit of time that I have left. And one of them that's very important is corporations. I wanna talk about corporations for a second. And this is a big one. Many people, as I go around the country, uh, their businesses, their small to medium-sized businesses are formed. And this is for you and to tell your brethren about, they're formed, well, I'm a corporation in the state of California, taxed as an S corporation. Okay, very popular. Matter of fact, most of the businesses will find a few that are taxed to C corporations. Um, but most of them, you know, corporations, taxes as corporations, long way. And I say to them, okay, let's get some understanding of some a very important component. Now, there are two sources of liability to that business. And let's examine what those two sources of liability are. One is liability coming as a result of the operations of that business. We call it internal liability. We have, you know, liability from employees, liability from accidents, product liability, you know, everything business related. And so when we have that liability, the purpose of the corporation, uh, the LLC, uh, the limited partnership is to limit the liability to the value of that entity and not reach our personal assets, assuming, assuming that you have run the business properly. 
that you're not taking money out that you shouldn't take out. You're not paying for groceries and bonds from the corporation. You're not buying jewelry from, I see it, people buy jewelry from the corporation, paying their kids college expenses from the corporation, giving you know, you know, their wife a, a, or, or their husband a car. They don't really work there. They put the kids on the payroll. They don't show up. It goes on and on and on. We put Uncle, Uncle Guido on the, on, on, the, on the health insurance and he doesn't really work there. I mean, they're kind of using it improperly. And then if with a company was worth $2 million and I have a $4 million liability, hopefully we convince a judge perhaps to break through or, or that called piercing the veil, you've seen it, get up to your assets. And now if you don't have asset protection around your house and everything else that we're talking about, those now are in jeopardy altogether. Those are the inside liabilities. So one of the things we need to examine for all entities is what's inside those entities. Do we have too much money inside those entities? Do we have too many assets inside those entities? Have we combined intellectual property inside those entities? Do we have too many valuable machines in those entities, too many trucks? You know, so how can we structure those entities so a liability in one area doesn't necessarily take down the whole company? Beyond the scope of what we have time to talk about today. But here's the big one. The liability that we don't think about is a liability to the owner of the corporation or the owners of the corporation. So let's say my wife and I, we have a, uh, a small widget company. We manufacture widgets. We've got some machines, some value, whatever else it may be. And you surprisingly enough, in small business owners, um, businesses represent 80 to 85% of their net worth. So a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of assets are in there. And we have a liability because my wife crashed the car on the 55 freeway, all right? And so now that becomes a community liability because we don't, we don't have, we didn't have a, a post-marital agreement. And we look down at the assets that we have. What so many people fail to realize is that the stock of the corporation is a redeemable asset. In other words, the creditor can take the stock of the corporation. So, my widget company, I own 50% of the stock. My wife owns 50% or the community owns 100%. They could take the stock of my widget company. Now the creditor owns my company. The creditor takes over the board. The creditor liquidates my company. They take the assets. They sell off the machines, sell off the trucks, you know, sell my intellectual property to a competitor in order to satisfy the claim. So everybody that's running a small business in the form of a corporation all right, is subject to that, what we call reverse liability, where we lose control of the entity because they took the stock. So may I make a strong suggestion to each and every one of you on the valuation, again, in this small amounts of time that we have together this morning, is maybe something called a plan F reorganization of that entity. What do we actually do here? What we actually do is turn that corporation into a limited liability company in a favorable state, a Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, South Dakota, and authorizes to do business in California. All right. And it winds up becoming a multi member or an, a limited liability company. But, and it's, it, which, this is the something which is called the statutory re conversion. So, what happens is, is that for tax purposes, we continue, very important to tax as a corporation. It's the same as corporation it was before. Same as corporation, same C corporation that we had before. So for tax purposes, you still file the same 1120S. But boy, the world just changed, Bill, because now a liability against you, I cannot take away your LLC membership interest. I cannot go in and take over managerial control. I cannot liquidate your company I could put a lien on distributions. I can't even force you to make a distribution. So now when I go to work every day for my widget company, I have on the risk of losing my company. So if I could lose my house and lose my company, tell me, ladies and gentlemen, how much, how much negotiating power do you have with the plaintiff? Not very much. Now, if you can't lose your house, you're not going to lose your company. We got a little staying power. We get into mediation, arbitration. We can get there and get this resolved. So very important to know that reorganization and conversion. Now, again, don't have time. Let you know that the contracts before are the same. It's the same. It's the same company. It's not a new company, and it all it all kind of remains the same. So I wanted to bring that to your attention, and also the fact that I seen just yesterday. Uh, you know, I see them every day. I see people. 
they are in business, they have real estate, you know, they have a piece of rental property, a two piece of rental property, have it in their own name. And guess what? Uh, -uh. The, who's, the, who's the landlord? They are. So they're liable to the full extent of the net worth. That should be shoved into a limited liability company as well. So let me go around. There are 529 plans. There's special asset protection for those. There's asset protection, the way we put together our estate plans for our children to provide asset protection for our children. We have the utilization of asset protection trusts for ourselves. We have the organization of our businesses in such a way that we can't lose control of our businesses. Organization of the way in which we hold real estate, et cetera. So what's the takeaway before I take just a few questions in the few moments that we have left? The takeaway is, is that everybody, everybody should take a look, a snapshot. We're willing to help you with this. Take a snapshot of where you're at, how you hold things, where they are, how they're, how they're, how they're, how they're structured, and let us tell you what the vulnerabilities are and what the opportunities are so you go eyes wide open. That doesn't mean you have to do anything. It's free to have us take a look at it and say, hey, Bill, these are the, these are the vulnerabilities and why, and here are some of the solutions that you have available to help make that better. So, and to me, uh, maybe I'm jaded, but uh, I think it's really critical that we've all worked so hard to, for our assets. We live in the, one of the most litigious states in the world, uh, in the country and, and, and places in the world. We should have the best protection, the best armor at all times so we can fully and fairly make proper decisions in our business. And with that, Marla, I'll turn it over for questions. If you have some questions, let me go through uh, that, that for you. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, but it's only an hour. That's all, it, all 